How are we on Zoom? Good? Hey, how you all doing? Good afternoon. My name is Greg Niemeyer, and I'm just so privileged to be here with you today. You get to know each other more and more, and uh, if, we, if we keep going like this, eventually I'll start my lecture. You'll just keep chatting the whole time because you now know each other, and that's exactly what I was hoping would happen. I, you know, we have this opportunity to get together um, and to spend some time of our lives studying. And as we do, we transform ourselves, but we also transform our communities. And that means we form communities here together. So at the last lecture, I hope I don't have to say anything anymore. And you just keep going with whatever you're talking about. And that'll be the moment when, when you learned what you need to learn, okay? So I appreciate that so much. And uh, I'm here today to um, thank really um, uh, arts and design and the letters and sciences and the many people who make it possible for us to just sit in a room and think about something. Um, uh, together for a moment. That includes, you know, the workers that built the building, the people that bring the power in, the, the land we stand on, and the history of the land that we want to acknowledge when we, when we, when we start something like this, and uh, and all the labor that goes into our food and our just daily life. And it's a wonderful pri privilege that we don't need to fight for that right now. That we instead can think about life itself from a from a from the benefit of a, say, an academic perspective for a moment. And it's a real privilege and uh, here today to make that count for us is uh, Pablo Gonzalez. And uh, I'm gonna introduce, introduce him in just a moment. Just wanted to mention a few things. Um, first of all, uh, today we have a new media component I'd like us to use called Artivive. So uh, you can uh, point your phone at that uh, icon and uh, uh, that's a, a way for machines to talk to machines. And uh, you can get uh, um, access to the Artivive app this way, and uh, uh, that should work. It's 41 megabytes of install. You can delete it after the course if you want, but um, or after this lecture. But it'll be really cool because it'll be able to um, show us layers in the slides that we wouldn't see otherwise. So um, I'll leave that up for a moment in case you want to take that picture. You good? Did it work? Excellent. OK. Um, then uh, I wanted to talk. Uh, again, about the work that we shared last time a little bit. Um, so just for Pablo's benefit and for the benefit of the audiences that are uh, with us online, um, this course is very much about um, very for very different forms of creativity across um, the university. And uh, right now we're looking at versioning things by studying them and reflecting on them, pulling things out of the archive and making them ours. And uh, so here's a work by Mia Schwinghammer that um, refers to an exhibit here at the Berkeley Art Museum where we are uh, located to um, the exhibit is called New Time, and uh, there's a neon sign on on the front of the exhibit that says "Old Feminist." And here are all the other voices that come up when we see something called uh, when Mia saw something like "Old Feminist." All these other voices came up for her, and uh, that just deepens the context of the work. And is exactly the kind of drawing from the archive and versioning that we're talking about here. Um, in our current project, we're going to be inspired by Pablo to go look at the city as a source of information and inspiration, but also of contest, like what, what city we, do we want to live in? Is this the city we like, we feel safe in, or do we need to change it somehow for it to be our city? And uh, so uh, your, your chance is to go version the city here with uh, uh, observations of existing murals or by creating new murals of your own. And I just want to acknowledge that some of you already had gone out and sketched a mural and uh, uh, had interesting experiences standing there sketching something where people saw you draw something and uh, saw this, this one student of ours draw something and walked up to her and talked to her about why she was drawing this mural. And <clears throat> that clarified that there's a community looking at a mural uh, in a kind of a passive way. And when you stand there and look at it carefully and draw it, you turn that passive obs observation of the mural into an active observation. And that active observation is, um, a form of witnessing, witnessing change, witnessing advocacy. And uh, so it was really beautiful how, uh, you can see it in our, our B courses, it was really beautiful how that first project that was posted was already reflecting this kind of act, uh, act of witnessing things. So uh, speaking of witnessing, we're now gonna go on to um, talk about social movements. And uh, our guest speaker today indeed is Pablo Gonzalez, a dear colleague, uh, professor of ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. And uh, he's a first uh, generation Chicano scholar activist, born and raised in Berkeley, California. And uh, uh, 
uh, eventually you know, um, he, he got a, a BA in Chicano studies at the University of California, Berkeley, went to study his, for his PhD in the University of Texas, Austin, uh, and then uh, started writing his dissertation, finished his dissertation on Autonomy Road, the Cultural Politics of Chicano and Autonomous Organizing in Los Angeles, California. And uh, he's uh, in the middle of publishing this as a book. Is it, how's that going? Almost there, okay, onwards. Autonomy Road, on the road to Autonomy Road. And uh, um, so his current research addresses the effects of the post-2008 housing crisis on Latino and black families. But today, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez is uh, here to talk about his year-long collaborative project to document the recent plywood murals in downtown Oakland, which is really wonderful because uh, as active living scholars in the active living community, we get to sometimes pivot and say, wait, this seems more important than everything else. I'm going to focus on my class, my research, my thinking on this uh, this moment in time that I get to witness. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pablo Gonzalez. No, it's easy. That's why I changed it myself. Oh, you changed it. Yeah, okay, okay. no worries. Well, uh, thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I already mentioned that I was probably going to be moving around. It's kind of how I usually teach. I like to move around. Um, this project that I'm going to present on is a project that I, myself, uh, and with some of your probably classmates and colleagues on campus, have been working on for the last uh, year, as uh, Greg mentioned. And it's something that emerges out of the fact that we've seen an, um, an explosion of, of art and performance response to the continuous um, anti-black police violence in cities and in communities all over the country and if not the world. And we are in a sense provoked um, wherever we are at when we see images not only of protests but of calls for uh, dignity and life to respond in many ways. And one of the responses in places like Minneapolis, Minnesota, after the killing of George Floyd, or of other places, especially in Oakland, California, by artists was to paint. And if you were in the Bay Area last summer, there's no way you could, for instance, somehow not see this, especially in the downtown area. But my, the project itself actually emerges from understanding and participating in social movements in many different places around the world and understanding that when they appear, these moments of explosion of art and performance to show that dignified rage around the injustices, around the killings of black folks, that we know that those moments will always also create a response, whether it be a state response or in the sense of the city, uh, a response of erasure. The city is both a place of memory, but it's also a place of erasure. And we understand it as erasure because nothing's ever permanent. Buildings decay, they're built over, right? We look on campus, for instance, some of our favorite places to eat no longer there, right? Uh, certain buildings that we're accustomed to seeing have been renamed because of battles fought by students to rename them. So the very nature of urban landscapes are always in tension with these calls for dignified rage, for dignity, for life, and so on. So this project, in a sense, stems from that. And trust me, folks, when I say that, that we didn't anticipate creating, for instance, a gallery, a, 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 an accessible gallery, an open public gallery of the images, I mean, of the murals, the hundreds of murals that were painted during uh, the summer of 2020 up until probably the summer of 2021 in downtown Oakland. But there was, again, many of us in our different calls to show solidarity, to be uh, in community or to build community, thought that there might be a need here to document something here. 
in also in relationship to the many artists that came from different backgrounds, from different parts of the Bay Area, if not the different parts of the state. And so part of what I'm gonna present is this project that we completed, and we were able to complete it through a course that I taught this summer and facilitated, part of the Future Histories uh, portfolio here on this campus. And the students were tasked with uh, putting together and mapping where these murals were at, finding where these murals were at, and finding out that they're no longer there. The plywood is gone. Because there's something also about the question of erasure in this context, that these murals were placed on predominantly plywood, wood, you know, that you find that were covering up windows, uh, storefronts, parts of downtown area and downtown Oakland, yeah? Which already lets us know of the temporary, like the temporariness of these particular types of art. So this is something that we want to think about. And we came up with, I think, a statement that hopefully would offer as a contribution to not only the people on the ground marching and protesting and organizing, but also the artists themselves, that we hope will continue and build a life of its own. One of remembrance, not of erasure. And I'll just read briefly. Our contribution is to amplify the solidarity and community work produced by artists and community members over the last year through their plywood murals. In a city that is historically one of the arteries of the black radical tradition, whitewashing, black insurgency and solidarity art on walls is a common occurrence. Our multimedia image gallery is a response to these recent developments in downtown Oakland. We attempt to accomplish this through the storytelling of some of the artists who painted murals in downtown Oakland and through the use of augmented reality. So here the intent again is always to make sure that the voices of those who painted them, um, which they amplified through their art, is also through their words, what motivated them, what you know, process they went in terms of, of painting these different murals, graffiti pieces. We're talking about all kinds of different uh, pieces of art that they placed uh, along these plywood, uh, pieces of plywood. What the gallery attempted to do is three, three, three things, and there might be more, but I think three central things. Remember the powerful tapestry of creativity and art that kind of uh, went through the downtown Oakland George Floyd BLM murals uh, through an incomplete mapping of these. So we, again, mapped throughout um, the downtown area where they were placed, uh, you know, what, what piece they were there and so forth. Amplify the work of the murals, of uh, the muralists themselves, through a series of podcasts that my students in the summer created. We interviewed many of the uh, murals that, uh, muralists that we reached out to um, and created a series of podcasts for that, uh, in that conversation, uh, asking them again um, about their own practice, but also about what, why they felt the need to go in downtown Oakland during the marches and paint. And then uh, the response, to respond to the removal of the murals for whatever reason. Some of these murals have been removed to be placed in a museum. The Oakland Museum, for instance, holds some of them. Some of them just got taken down, thrown away. So to respond to that already erasure, because if you go to downtown Oakland, you might find some new murals, but definitely not the ones that initially were placed there during the summer of 2020, how to create a, a remembrance of those of what was there so that the whitewashing, and the whitewashing we'll talk about in a second, um, is not something that characterizes the type of insurgent urban space that we might imagine. And, I go, and again, we always hope that this is a place of encounter or some form of collective liberation. And so these political concerns, at least in its initial phase, also are combined with the inspiration. And these are the questions that I initially asked myself, is how black insurgency and social movements confront state violence, right? The, the protests themselves, the creativity of the protests, the nature of the protests, the continuation of those protests as part of a longer circulation of struggle that we know as 
the black radical tradition uh, for, for dignity in life. And also to think about the role of the state and capital, especially in regards to the, the viability of a city in regards to its economic base, uh, store shops, corporations, and so forth, in its attempts often to discredit the protests and erase much of the symbols and meanings of the protests, right? And this is something as a social movement scholar I always think about, right? Social movements are not solely just protests. Social movements are not solely taking to the streets. But taking to the streets becomes, for many, that act of rage that develops into so much more, that flowers into so much more, that has in its capacity to grow into the social fabric of communities, especially as they often are faced with senses of hopelessness. And so from hopelessness, we always find hope. But those moments of hope are oftentimes the catalyst for those are the creative explosions that we find. And so in this explosion of solidarity art, because it is a form of solidarity art, many of the artists themselves are not black or do not identify as black, uh, emerge as this new form of, of solidarity. And at the same time, they're confronted with this question of whitewashing. Now, you can use the Art of Ive image, and I'm hoping it works because we try to test it out. What we did, and what I was thinking here was, at some point, these things are coming down. As soon as you see the beauty of these murals, you know that at some point they're coming down. And whitewashing has its history. I always teach my students of a particular whitewashing um, in Los Angeles, California in the 1930s of the famous uh, muralist artist David Alfaro Siquero, who in 1932, in the wake of mass deportations of Mexicans called repatriations, painted America Tropical, a critique and response to American imperialism. And how upon people viewing it in Los Angeles, soon after its painting, it was whitewashed, literally painted over it with white paint until recently when it's uncovered and now drawn as a part of the cultural uh, symbols of Los Angeles. And in this context, I knew that this would happen and that they would try to mark a sense of it never happened. And when we say it never happened, we're also saying the deaths of Breonna Taylor never happened. We're saying that the death and killing of Ahmaud Arbery never happened. We're saying that George Floyd murder never happened because what we're seeing is a response by many communities, but also in particular by the many black communities in Oakland and throughout the country to the continued forms of police violence. So whitewashing on walls is a process of erasure. Are we able to see it? Yeah? It's not working? Try uh, starting it up again. Sometimes what you have to do is kind of like uh, resetting it, in a sense, from your phone. But it should show one of the murals. What we try to do is use augmented reality to show the mural where it used to be. Let me know if you see it. Does it show? It shows if you probably point, point it at the screen, right? Anybody up there can see it? We'll figure it out. It's, it's again, we're, we, we tested and tested, but it always kind of, I'm sure people on Zoom are able to see it. <laughs> but uh, there'll be some others. But in this particular case, these images, what we tried to do with augmented reality was to show the after, but then put the pictures of the murals that used to be there. So as to make a point about this question of erasure make a statement of this erasure. So in this case, you'll see, for instance, the image of Malcolm X and a quote by Malcolm X. Now, we also asked several other questions. And these are, I think, questions that we would ask in regards to understanding the moment a little bit better. What does it mean to produce public art, much broader speaking, in a, 
in an era of permanent protest. And I believe we are in an era of permanent protest. If that era, at least in the last 500 years, has always been in a permanent resistance. And so that understanding of the role of public art here is something that we asked ourselves. We also asked the role of art collectives and of artivists, as many of them call themselves, in constructing these murals. And we asked what kind of techniques and forms of public art they themselves produce and the approaches they took. Now, my entry into this is in the work that I did in solidarity with indigenous social movements, especially in southern Mexico. And the use of symbols, uh, especially of insurgency, of, of changing communities, in particular in Zapatista communities, that were murals that were painted by and in collaboration with communities all over the world. In particular, in my case, with Chicana and Chicano activists from the United States. Murals that they came to down south to Chiapas and in, with Zapatista communities painted dozens of murals all over the Zapatista region of Chiapas. And at the same time, even famous uh, black artists like Emery Douglas, the, the graphic designer extraordinaire of the Black Panther Party, um, went down to Chiapas and also painted with Zapatista communities. So you see, in a sense, the bringing together of different radical traditions. Uh, in response to much global processes of inequality and racism and injustice, but also in the bringing together of different stories. Now, what brought us then is, as I mentioned, this question of the continued police violence and murders of, through uh, the increase of white supremacy of white supremacist violence against black men, women, and trans people through, that drew massive protest and mobilization throughout the country. And in particular, the May 25th murder of George Floyd by Eric Chauvin in Minneapolis. Now, Oakland has been, I think, an epicenter for a response, not only because uh, it holds that tradition, but because of prior moments where we saw this, especially in the deaths, um, the killings of Neil Wilson, and also of Oscar Grant and other folk throughout the last 15 years. I'm hoping y'all can see this one, no? Can you see it through that one, Greg? Nothing over there? Yeah, I know it's kind of weird, right? Maybe it's all because they're all trying it at the same time. Okay, let's try it. Does, it, does that help? Might be the angle. Artifact is kind of quirky sometimes, especially if you if all everybody's looking at it at the same time. Um, it, it's, you know, just like any augmented reality, it's picking up different parts of, a, of an image and then having to register those that's already registered. Yeah. yeah. The blinking eyes, yeah. And it's a little bit kind of 2D. Some of them have video, and let me, let me see if we can get the video ones, yeah. Now, in that regard, with the protests happening, and the protests lasted weeks into many of the cities, we saw that the placement of plywood uh, on windows, in storefronts, uh, becomes part of now uh, the assembly of not only COVID, right, as people themselves are sheltering in place, but now uh, stores face thinking or fearing uh, some form of uh, breaking of windows, of property, and so forth. So plywood is oftentimes placed, displaced, especially in a place like downtown Oakland. And so this was an opportunity for many artists to come into downtown uh, and start using the canvas that is the urban landscape, that is 
especially in this case, downtown Oakland. So again, how do we make sense of these things? And how this is a part of, I think, uh, also a longer history of muralism in the Bay Area. If we think about muralism in the Bay Area, Oakland and San Francisco, especially the Mission District in San Francisco, have shown this connection with many different social movements. Central American solidarity, especially during the 80s civil wars, and also other, I think, uh, images of community, especially in regards to uh, Asian diaspora communities, black communities, and Latinx communities throughout the, Bay Area, to, throughout the Bay Area. And the plywood murals, I think, is unique. And in fact, what we find in other places, especially with other projects that have tempt to, tempted to map the murals, is that, the, again, the, the very nature of the plywood becomes a, a medium, a temporary medium, that uh, it, it, it already for the artist, especially the, the artist who either uh, is a graffiti artist or a muralist, is an opportunity to ex of expression. It's their, as one of them says, it's their podium to, to, to respond to in whatever way possible to the injustices that are happening around them. Uh, and so businesses, very much put up these, and many muralists actually you know, ask for permission from these businesses to paint on them. And some businesses even ask some muralists for them to also paint these murals. So there was, in many cases, collaborations between the businesses themselves and the muralists. But in most cases, people went up, found a spot, and started painting. And they did this throughout the entire downtown and into Chinatown area. Now, at some point, they were taken down. And our class, upon making a trip to the downtown area, found that a lot of them were missing. And most of the store owners didn't know what happened to them. Some of them were collected. Some of the more famous ones, and I'll show you several of them, um, are now part of a collection that a, a community center uh, was able to collect and part of the Oakland Museum collection. But many of them are completely gone. In fact, some of the uh, well-known muralists, uh, some of their pieces, they don't know where they went. No one ever told them that they were being taken down and so forth. So again, the permanence of this is just a sense that they're going to be temporary, and now they're gone from the downtown area. Now, if you go to downtown, you will find murals, some of them still there. Um, and some of them are now uh, recently painted. And you will also find all kinds of other types of art or some kind of response. But we can talk about what those might be and whether or not they are, in a sense, a way to um, almost undermine the nature of the plywood murals. And so we took pictures during that summer of 2020, uh, and we found people painting. So these are of some of the muralists that just went and started painting. This is right at Oscar Grant Plaza, what is called Oscar Grant Plaza. And we took pictures. We started a map where they were with the anticipation of what we knew the city always responds with, with which is bringing them down. And we thought of how to be able to respond in using new media, which is the augmented reality, uh, to respond to this by knowing that sooner or later we were going to place these um, for people to see. Now, if you see a gallery and all you see is storefronts, you're going to be like, what kind of gallery is this? So the augmented reality shows you this other layer, this, this clandestine story of murals that are no longer there. It brings to life again the story of insurgency, the continued nature of black life in Oakland, which we all know because of cost of living, because of police violence, because of many different reasons, me, has meant the black flight of people from Oakland into other communities. So how to respond to that and how to make sure that through art you're able to do that. And that's, I think, one of the major issues that we ourselves thought about in regards to um, this particular type of explosion of art. And these are some of the different paintings that you saw. Uh, this is around where Pete's Coffee's at. Uh, you saw, again, tons of different styles of 
graffiti, um, of different type of art and so forth, uh, images of uh, George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor. Um, sometimes you would just have the name of people that had been killed by police violence along the, uh, the different walls um, as a remembrance, as a way of honoring. You saw altars, especially to pay, uh, again, respects to those who have been killed. Let's try it again. Let's see if we can do this one. I should be able to see it online. I, I heard a little, oh, so maybe that's a good thing. Y'all see that part? So this one, uh, students, and these are all done by students uh, just like yourselves. They embedded videos that we got from different news sources of the protests all over the country. So in this one, you'll see a video when you point it. So it's not only, for instance, uh, a question of, of the white washing wall and then the image that used to be there, but sometimes we put, for instance, different ourselves, uh, different uh, responses or homages or altars in a sense. In this case, we put a video that we created of the different protests. And don't worry if you can't see them. Um, I'm going to give the link for the entire gallery. You're going to be able to have it. And then you can, on, on your computer, be able to see it yourself, yeah? So you can see it. And it's, it's a, I mean, we made that website so slow because <laughs> it's so many of them that we put up that you'll be able to see that. Uh, this is another one. This is by one of the... This one has a little bit of the interview by one of the uh, muralists, El Maldito. And, it and this one, in a sense, talks about um, the connections between the killings of, of black people by police and also of, of brown folks in East Oakland, in particular, the killings of Eric Salgado and others. And this one was done by a Chilean muralist, Kili Munoz, who used the symbol of the, um, the Chilean riot dog, riot dog. So to combine different struggles. During that summer, if not through the spring, there were mass protests in Chile around austerity, around uh, police violence. And there was the symbol of the, of the Mapuche dog, uh, the Matapaco, who um, was seen at a lot of the protests and was like confronting the cops. It's amazing videos. So we placed one of those uh, songs on this particular mural uh, because it's the combining of those. It's the meaning of different movements and uh, this conversation between the forms of violence that are happening in different locations. And then we in part of that, we, we interviewed a lot of the muralists, and I'll play this real quick because I know we're definitely short on time for things, but I want for you to listen to this. And this is an interview with one of our muralists, La, uh, Lakina, and here she describes, I think, a little bit of what you know, motivated her in terms of painting her piece. And the piece that you see below, the one that says protect, is the one that she did. Oops, let me go back. You are listening to Plywood Stories, a podcast series dedicated to the Black Lives Matter murals in Oakland, California. We noticed that a lot of your art, you know, intersects with activism and especially during these times, you know, regarding last year's events with George Floyd's murder and all of the BLM events that happened, our minds are reflecting back to last year, which can't believe it's been a year and, and you know, the, the conversations are still happening. I, I, we're, ex we're hoping that those continue, but um, your art is able to kind of preserve these feelings that we felt last year. Could you kind of speak on your work currently and, and your work that revolved around uh, the BLM events last year? Sure. Um, 
you know, I was raised in a very conscious and culturally conscious household. So it, again, that's going to be a really strong theme in my artwork. Um, understanding again, art as a tool to, you know, push ideas, to create conversation, to help educate, you know, for advocacy, everything that went down last year, including what everything like, leading up to it, honestly, you know, has um, just really encouraged myself and many of my peers to really like, you know, continue to step out of our comfort zones and be willing to be brave and loud in the public sphere so that we can really communicate our concerns with, you know, what's going on in our public epidemic of racism and white supremacy to really really make people understand that like this is, these are things that need to be addressed you know we don't need to lose any more lives any more community members any more uh, family relative whether we know them or not know them you know we feel them here at home um, when we're kind of connected into that humanity and larger global family it's really awful what's happening you know with the situation with police brutality it's really awful what's happening with lack of justice being served to our perpetrators who have licenses to kill for many people it could be interesting that, uh, to see art as a legitimate sort of tool in defense to protect ourselves to be able to again do some of the facilitate a lot of the healing work that we need to do as well so we can continue to do the work that needs to be done instead of constantly feeling traumatized or in grieving mode one of the messages i would like to be able to offer Offer in this conversation today and through the art that I produce is that it's very legitimate, it's very powerful and potent, and we encourage it. And it's almost like even to address the fact that, for example, in many public schools, like art isn't being offered, music, dance, you know, those things aren't being offered. And it could be an awesome tool that we can use so that we're not dealing with a lot of the problems we're dealing with today. This was also during the time that um, I think we were like the shelter in place was pretty strong and they had the, the curfews. They didn't want anyone coming out into the streets. And um, I really want to honor the spirit of Oakland and the spirit of cities similar to ours that the heart of the people is very strong and we want our voices to be heard. And we can't just be silenced very easily. And so one of the pieces I'll will be speaking more in detail about the Protect Life piece was definitely born from that, you know, contribution of resistance. We won't be silent as our fallen brothers and sisters are being taken out, you know, innocently, and that we do need reform in a lot of our systems, a lot of our public services. This mural um, is in downtown Oakland and is surrounded by a lot of other murals. And there are a lot of them are being created at the same time. What was it like to be creating this mural either at the same time or around the same time as other artists who had the same feelings as you? Well, it's awesome. I mean, we're definitely having an arts renaissance and a resurgence of art, again, as a really necessary tool. I mean, there's also a movement around the artists being essential workers. I'm not sure if you all had a chance to hear some of those things going on, but, you know, we're here as also first responders. You know, we're doing a lot of what I can that is very spiritual work, you know, in healing humanity. And we are we we all have a chance to kind of speak at this podium. And the podium at this point are these these blank walls, these boarded up walls that make our, our city at the time last summer feel very much like this really Armageddon zombie apocalypse, kind of really bizarre experience and amazingness of transformation is happening when artists are being called to, you know, say, hey, express yourself and what, what you're feeling. And it's a beautiful kind of like melting pot, right, of different perspectives of coming from different backgrounds and different age levels, everything, you know. And we're all saying we have the right to respond to this and not be quiet about what's happening. protests themselves are having an impact. And this is an interesting way of thinking about it, right? The, the work of healing. If we think about in relationship to what healing means for communities that are in constant attack, that are in constant uh, sense of, of, of not being able to, for themselves to think about uh, healing from trauma, generational trauma and so forth, but also the attacks of both state violence and other forms of violence, then the artists themselves seeing themselves as first responders speaks to the moment not only of fighting for racial justice, but also the question that, um, of what we're going through in terms of a pandemic, a global pandemic. And the first responders here are about using their voice, but also through their, the medium of art to respond to those in however way they're going to respond. And I'll say this, that a lot of the muralists here themselves don't always consider themselves to be activists, and that's crucial. Because you can't, these aren't necessarily muralists that they would think of themselves as political per se, but found the need and says, I need to be there. I need to show this particular uh, point of view that I have 
and I need to be there in solidarity. I think that's to say that not everybody here is somehow uh, politically sophisticated in their analysis, but, but still has something to say. And these muralists, I think, were taking that very clearly in a serious way. Um, this one here is by PZ, and I'll play this. Uh, it's a rather um, short one. What does solidarity mean to you, and how does your art further this solidarity with different struggles or uh, with a specific movement? Man, I think solidarity is so important because you have to start somewhere. But once you put your voice out there and you see other people that are on your same wavelength, it's important to come together, start a movement together if you guys feel passionately about something. And for me, I think, especially with the Free Palestine movement and giving information out that's valuable information if people don't understand what's happening right now just to show solidarity with different groups and i had seen a post that was like if black women are liberated everybody's liberated and i think that comes from the fact that we are a suppressed group and we can help other people that are suppressed as well and we can all come up together so i think that's important with this in mind we asked muralist cc carpio the same question and she said there's also just recognizing that the struggles that other folks have might not be similar, it might actually be a bit different, but acknowledging that their liberation is really tied to our own. Yeah, I, I totally agree. How do you feel about like the role of an artist in creating solidarity with other movements that you don't necessarily belong to with your personal identity? Like you said, with the Free Palestine thing, like what do you think about artists from a different group creating art to speak for somebody else. Do you think that that can be a positive thing? Do you think it can be harmful? It can be harmful if you don't have the right education on it. If it's just something that maybe you were thinking about, you have to make sure that you're asking these people, especially the ones that are facing the challenges themselves, to make sure you see it from their perspective. Because sometimes it can be different when you see it from an outside perspective and you're not actually living it. So I think it is important, but I think seeing art is a great tool because it's not just throwing information at you. It's making you feel so Thing. You can be emotionally connected to art and it can hit you in a different way than just a textbook or media. But I think it is important for that. With this piece right here, uh, again, uh, the, the, what we did with the Art of Eye for this is we filled the TV screen with, again, videos from the protests and from other parts. Again, just trying to show a little bit more of the moment um, and also of the work that PZ uh, had done throughout the different uh, murals that she painted. Here's another uh, one that we also did um, that has, again, another set of murals and so forth. Um, and it, it, I think, again, as we started to put together some of these uh, um, art of eyes, some, some of these augmented reality parts, if you were to see this and point it at it, it would, it would show up. Um, it's working out for you. And, and we, we, again, our, the students really try to think about the message and how to respond and then to, to also pay respect to the artist, but also to the movement itself. Always thinking about that engagement and that conversation and what it might mean. Now, at some point, again, when we came back and found that many of them had, got, had left, we started to see here that, uh, what does this mean? What happens? in this collective show of solidarity a year later of dignified rage once the plywood is removed. And how can we continue, again, this, this work, this insurgent work of, and practice that many of these communities in resistance, the protest themselves, protesters themselves and the artists intended to have and continue to fight for. And so again, this was part of our uh, response, something like that. And here, the, if the image here of the storefront uh, in downtown Oakland, is to show one of the more famous uh, murals, which is C.C. Uh, Carpio of Trust Your Struggle, um, of a mural that shows uh, um, black lives and indigenous lives. So it's the meeting of both uh, black and indigenous uh, peoples and show of solidarity. And it's, I think, one of the more um, symbolic or at least well-known images of the murals in downtown Oakland, um, if you can see it. And uh, some of these that I'll show are just storefronts. And again, you might look at them and be like, that's not a mural. In the art of I, we attempted to, again, place the, the, the murals that are there. Can you see those, Greg? Let me see if I can see it with mine real quick. 
Can y'all see? Y'all see it over there, right? Because you have the thing. Yeah, this one over here. Yeah. So we try to, in a sense, put the where it's at. And right here, you know, you could see the uh, one mural right there. And, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's to, again, show the plywood and where it used to be there as a response. And some of them have audio. Some of them are just the mural itself. This one um, has Breonna Taylor. Again, these are really hard augmented realities to do. Why? Because augmented reality, in this case, picks up certain points. It's kind of like this, uh, you know, the dark side of augmented reality is facial recognition. So it tries to recognize certain points. So what, do you, what are you going to find in terms of a, of, a, of a window, right? It's very hard to pick it up. So we really tried to make sure that it was possible. And in this case, um, if, if it comes out, which is a lot harder here, um, the, the image of Breonna Taylor, the, uh, one of the murals, um, and I'll show you in a second uh, if, that as we get into the other period. And in this one, there's um, it's another saying here, um, uh, just us. And this one, um, again, is, is placed there. Again, a lot of these um, are just now covered up or painted over whitewashed symbols. And we try to place a lot of the murals on top of them. Um, this one uh, also had one, I think it says Oakland Pride. And, and it's just the storefront in this case, but it says Oakland Pride on it. Yeah, y'all see that right there in the front, right? It's like those are folks are the ones that got all the, all the and in this one, you also see um, much of the art of vibes of the different ones. Uh, let me change. I'll change it back so you can see it. Yeah, I think this one was probably the more that we, it's hard to get that angle and we got it pretty good. And and I, I say this that, you know, when you when you think about this is, when we walk every day and we confront people and we confront spaces, what's our own emotional, right, spiritual, physical response to that encounter? And for many, again, when it comes to erasure, it's a sense of indifference. It's a sense of you're, you don't belong here. You've already made it very clear you don't want us here. And so when you show this and you're able to use this as a, like, as a response, I think it's to say we are still here in spite of everything. And, uh, and I think that's one of the, the things that we wanted to do with this. So I'll end with that, and maybe I can actually pull up the website so that you can see how we came up, how it looks like in that terms. But I'll end there so we can take some Q&A right on the dot from where I think you mentioned we should say. Let me just pull this up real quick, and then we'll... You can see the actual, I can kind of scroll through it if you have any questions. Um, and, you know, it'll take a little bit to, to even load it because this is how, how, how big it is, but it, you have fast internet here. So. so this is how it looks from the gallery perspective. And this is just kind of our collective um, statement, but then we go into the the podcasts that we made. So you can hear link to the podcasts. We have several podcasts and we're still growing in podcasts. If you all are interested in maybe working or helping with us, please let me know. I'll be, I'll be down to, you know, if you're wanting to do this. There's a, you know, there's tons of stuff that we still need to do for this and it can only be done with people power. It's not going to be done with anything but people power. Uh, we teach folks, you know, just really quick how to use Artivive from this particular context. Um, and then we go through the, through the actual mural. This is We Got Us is one of the more famous ones. This was done by C.C. Carpio as well. And you can see the altar, altar here, where there was a particular ceremony that was done, especially for um, the uh, lives of black women who have been lost by police violence and domestic violence and so forth. Um, this is the one that I was talking about in terms of indigenous for black lives, the one that was also taken down. And C.C. doesn't know where this one's at. She, she um, in one of the interviews with her, and uh, you know, I consider Cece a really good friend, and she said she doesn't know where this one's at. 
So we put the, uh, the, the image here for them, for people to see the art archive or where it used to be. And then we literally, I mean, this is without any kind of resource. All we did is go on Google Maps and, and snap, you know, screenshot, <laughs> and then place it where, where it, was, it used to be. Um, we're hoping that we can do some kind of GIS and things like that, some fancy stuff, but we don't have fancy money. So it's one of those things where we are doing that. This is that Lucas Tap Room. Um, the mural of the kind of some of the more famous ones here of Nipsey and also of, of the woman who was dry, uh, riding the horse, which was, I think, very much a big, big part of the mural of uh, the protests in downtown Oakland, uh, um, a symbol of the protests. Um, this is the dead president's one by Blaze, who uh, and, the, and th that one has a particular uh, podcast. And we labeled these um, according to what we saw in the mural. So that none of these had any particular names. So, uh, you know, definitely if you are one of the artists in the crowd, we apologize if we misnamed them. We just titled them from whatever was in the mural um, because many of them didn't have that, right? Um, and again, it just, this, you know, this is one of my favorites. I love, I just love this one. And this one, I mean, these are no longer there as well, and right there where Pete's Coffee used to be. This is another one. This is the one that, the one that I told you that we showed you, but I, we weren't able to see. Yeah, this one. This is what it was on there, the Breonna Taylor mural. And this is them putting another painting on the side of it during the time. This is right there by uh, Oscar Grand Plaza. This one's really cool too. This is the one that uh, you all saw with the blinking eyes. Yeah. And these are the two murals that uh, of of uh, PZ and another mural that were together that also has a, a podcast. So this thing goes on for a pretty long time. And again, we tried to be as extensive of all the pictures that we took. There's tons more that we have not gotten. Some of them, we don't know where they're at because we didn't necessarily get the precise location. Um, so we're, this is a work in progress in a sense of a, of a jigsaw puzzle of where they might be. Uh, some of our students found out that you could probably look back in time at some of the Google Maps where people have taken pictures and we've been able to find some of them that way, which is really interesting to see that kind of surveillance work on our favor. Um, but it, it, nonetheless, we don't know where many of these are. And again, some of these don't, don't look as sophisticated as some of them. You could tell some of them are, are, you know, are placed there for, you know, in different ways, but it, it, it didn't matter. It, it's the explosion of art by anybody who had a paintbrush or a spray can that I think was part of the, um, the moment. And, you know, the mask, of course, because of COVID, uh, we see this. Um, this is in the Tierra Mia. Many of these locations you probably all have been to, like Tierra Mia Cafe in downtown Oakland. They, all of Tierra Mia had in their windows these beautiful ones. This one was down by Mr. Bouncer. Bounce is a, a local of Berkeley. Um, he's also himself a tattoo artist and, and part of the Trust Your Struggle Collective. This is another C.C. Carpio piece, I, I believe. So as, as I go through this, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be, you know, this is the one that I told you that had the Malcolm X mural. Um, I'll take any questions, anything that you all have um, in terms of comments, um, but definitely, you know, thank you for everything. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> so let's see, um, we have two microphones and Matt's in the back. And uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hands. We have questions for uh, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez. I'm going to start with the question if there's no other ones. I really, are there any questions in the chat? Okay, good, good. Well, well thank you for this uh, tour in, in both in space and history and, uh, and of course, in, in the struggle. And uh, 
I wanted to ask you about the many layers of murals. Yeah. And uh, because there's the city and then there's the plywood and then there's the painting and then there's the Instagram layer on top of that as well. And then, of course, there's the layer that you add with Artivive and your mediation of the images. And so images, um, they, any thoughts about those layers and how they relate to each other? Do they all support each other or are there moments where maybe they, they challenge each other as well? Like, so that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, there's always a clear difference between murals that are, for instance, commissioned versus those that are put up um, in, in a clandestine kind of you know, way. Like if we think about graffiti and its response or its, or its the tension with policing and surveillance of space, right? And at the same time, many of these artists are including their, for instance, Instagram uh, tag so as to identify themselves, not all of them, but many of them. Um, and I think that's only done as, 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 I think, a part of many things. And I'm just here thinking out loud that part of what that is is the continuation of, um, in Chicano culture, the placaso. We call it the placaso. You put your name and what, the consafos, the sense that I was here. And so for many artists, I think, putting their Instagram or other kind of information is not only kind of trying to, I don't think it's trying to uh, commodify it or any particular way, but what it is trying to say is I was here, I'm here. Because many of them were themselves graffiti artists, folks that used to uh, tag up walls and so forth, but not our muralists, artists in more established locations and places. So there's a kind of wide range, I think, of experience of artists. I mean, you had uh, Skyline High School students, you had uh, people who just came and took one of the walls and started to paint or just tag up, you know, different kind of things uh, that they would, in response to how they felt, that rage. So what's interesting about all these murals is that there's no one way of, of how it went down, yeah? And some of them asked for permission, some of them didn't. Some of them knew that their, their murals would be kind of considered and looked at. And some of them really took the time to think about how they wanted or what message they wanted to place, while others just said, I got something to say. I don't know why, but I have to say it. I need to show solidarity or I need to show my rage. And, it, and, it, and it, I think for many of us, it inspired, it resonated. And, and about social movements, it is about resonance. What resonates in um, our collective rage as it becomes collective rage? Because here you also don't want to erase black rage, which is primarily what you show solidarity for and with, yeah? And so I think in part, it's, it's that kind of communication and encounter that's necessary, but at the same time, it's, it's about listening, but also being that being what they said, that first responder, right? As you listen, what is it your response? You mentioned witnessing. As you witness, what is your response to what you have witnessed? How are you changed? What is it that resonates with you? Your experience is not going to be the experiences of black folks in Oakland or in the United States. But nonetheless, you respond in a way by witnessing. And in that response, what are you going to show that shows that solidarity, especially if you're there for solidarity, and not to reproduce the violence on that? So I think part of what the, 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 the artists themselves are, are trying to negotiate that. And there are many layers to that, I think. Um, but here, I, I, you know, I dare to say, and I'm totally fine being corrected, but none of them here are making anything out of it, but are themselves, you know, many of them don't even know where these, their, their, mur their murals or pieces are at, right? So they know there was a moment, but it was also a moment of community building. And I think now in the United States, it can't happen without, right? That, 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 that next, explosion of creativity that's necessary, not only to express grief and rage, but also to express healing, as Kina was saying, yeah? So I think those also layers that are embedded in a lot of this work that the, the, the muralists are doing at, at, at those levels. Yeah, great. Uh, any other questions? Any, any questions from chat? This is another one I think it was really cool. And in this one, we did an, an actual Adobe Arrow. Go ahead. Um, for 
First of all, thank you. That was such a wonderful presentation. I loved being able to see all of these. And it's wonderful that you guys have this database, essentially, of all of these uh, works of art. Um, you've talked a lot about, um, you know, how these, these murals are ultimately um, impermanent and kind of transitory. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about the power of a transitory medium, because mm -hmm. we've seen that even though uh, often these end up whitewashed or painted over or, you know, they just disappear and no one knows where they are. Right. Um, they're still really, really powerful, um, show a lot of beauty and righteous rage. And so I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, a part of that comes, uh, you know, in my, when, I re when I was doing my research or working in Los Angeles, there's a mural that I always pass by, uh, done by a famous muralist, uh, graffiti artist, Nuke. And it was a, a, a famous figure in Mexican cinema Cantinflas, who was played by Mario Moreno. And Cantinflas is this kind of uh, the Mexican uh, uh, pelon, kind of like uh, the tramp, like uh, Charlie Chaplin. And, they, and it stood about maybe this tall, right, the mural, by, by one of the local schools in El Sereno, right, in the greater east side. And it, sell, it said, welcome to the barrio. Right? It's kind of an entryway. And I always passed by there when I would walk by there. And, and I, never th I always thought about the role of the, of the tramp here, uh, especially in the Mexican context, which was an internal migrant. M many of them were indigenous to Mexico City, for instance. They were coming in in the 1930s and 40s to Mexico City to work, having to strip a lot of their indigenous ways and customs in order to become part of the nation meant losing the language and the custom and then becoming part of the underclass. And so Cantinflas to me always represented that. And so when I saw this symbol, it represented the fact that the greater east side is that for the many different peoples that migrate to the, to the United States, in particular Los Angeles. And I say this because one day I pass by and it's not there. It's whitewashed. What does it mean to whitewash Cantinflas in a city like Los Angeles that's made up of mostly Latin American, from different parts of Latin America, um, communities? To whitewash Cantinflas is to whitewash the very nature of what's happening in LA. At the same time, LA also has a very strong kind of arts and culture uh, office in its downtown. And at, at that very moment, they're also thinking about re-commemorating and, and painting the um, Siqueiros piece that I mentioned earlier and making it now as part of the, the culture of Los Angeles, even though 70 years ago or 80 years ago, it was whitewashed. How do we make sense of that? On one level, you whitewash the very symbol of current, present Los Angeles. On the other end, you're bringing back what you had whitewashed without the politics embedded in Siqueiro's piece, right? So there's this kind of craziness that happens in urban landscapes, right? And we know this, to ha know this in our cities. As I drive, I, I, live, I still live in, you know, in Richmond, and as I drive through 23rd Street in Richmond, this beautiful mural that's placed right there on McDonald's and, and, and and 23rd of, of a new building that went up, a kind of supposedly mixed status uh, building, but mostly it's probably gonna be for people who can afford it, has this beautiful uh, mural that I saw a black man paint of all the different peoples that make up Richmond, which is a predominantly, I would say, uh, black and Latinx uh, uh, city. And to me, that is Richmond, all of it in its, in its, in its grounding in native cultures, because it showed um, a, a homage to the native peoples but it also showed who lives in Richmond there, right? So when you think about the question of murals, it gives you this kind of response and that you uh, see both community and somehow nostalgia at times, but at the same time, it's supposed to take you somewhere, especially when what adorns most of your life is gray, the, the gray of the concrete. And if all that adorns, then all that also creates is loneliness. The loneliness that the city, the neoliberal city in particular, it shows and represents. If we walk around the city with a constant sense of loneliness, how is it that we meet each other? How is it that we share in the healing practices necessary, especially when we're grieving? How can we grieve? in this particular moment that we're living in? And does the city allow for it, right? Does it allow for us to grieve in that sense? And I think the murals themselves 
even if they were temporary, were our first vaccine. Right? But the thing is, this country is not ready for that vaccine, especially when it comes to anti-black racism and violence. And so the question is that the responders themselves are the people that are saying, we want to be a part of the spreading of what's necessary in order to change that. Yeah? The problem is, is it's, it's also the response. You try to erase the ever possibility of there being a cure, right? And I think the whitewashing of it is the, is the sense of like, we need to not make sure that there's not a cure for this, right? I know this is kind of maybe like, oh, you're going a little bit too far. No, I really believe in this understanding of how the city itself is being constructed as a place of us in regards to our loneliness, yeah? And you take that in regards to our campus, and I always tell my students this, as you walk through Sproul, often we never see each other, whether it be through because we have a mask or not, but we don't see each other. We're, we're afraid to bump into each other. We're afraid to see each other in our eyes. We're afraid to understand and see and what that encounter might mean. So we reproduce that loneliness amongst ourselves as individuals, each of us with our own set of lonelinesses. We have to find a response to that. And I think many of these muralists whether they anticipated it or not, I think, were acting in that way. But they were also inspired by the fact that people were doing that in a pandemic, going out and protesting, right? Saying, my life, whether it be through a pandemic, through a virus, or through police violence, it, it, it's, it's already shown to not be worth anything. I have nothing to lose. And these artists are saying, we need to, rep we need to show that. We need to be able to speak to that. We might be maybe the people that might show a sense of how to heal. Yeah? So I would say something like that. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions here? No, then I believe. Um, Is it in the chat? It's our chat question? Yeah. OK, please. Um, Sarah Montes asks, how do you envision this project expanding in the future? I want it to take a life of its own. I want it to, for people to be critical of it. I want people to say, what about this? What about that? Um, it's not mine anymore. Uh, it wasn't mine to begin with. I think as we, we did it as, uh, in our class, we wanted it to be an offering. Um, I think that's the only way to, to do things as, as offering um, because then people can make it their own as well, can, can see it in that a genuine way. Um, I want it to be in conversation with the people that it's most impacted by. Um, I want it to include, and this is me speaking individually, to also include also some of those layers that we haven't completed um, with different forms of augmented reality. For instance, uh, we're using some Adobe Arrow there to also place them. So Adobe Arrow is another form of augmented reality that actually allows you to be able to do it on your phone to place the mural where it's at, right? Um, and, and for you to anchor it and then to be able to see it. We wanna be able to do some of that as well so that people all over the world can then see them on these walls, um, with, not just solely uh, through Artivive. Um, we also are thinking to continue to interview a lot of the muralists. We, we barely touch it. And folks, we did this with, with no budget. We tried to, uh, we, we tried to uh, uh, of course, uh, give gift cards or other uh, forms of compensation to the muralists, many of them who are struggling right now. And so we try to do whatever we could to give them you know, a $100 gift card, whatever we could. And we want to continue to do that. So that might mean as we grow and more people want to, for instance, add on to it, um, that that will be included as well. Um, and I definitely want to reach out to some of the other projects, in particular in Minneapolis, where some of the universities there have started to uh, create their own version of this, especially from those that are in Minneapolis where uh, George Floyd was killed. So, to, to continue to do that and maybe connect with other cities that want to continue maybe to work on this project at, at, a, at a much broader level. Any other questions? No, so good. So um, we're so silent and thoughtful maybe because <laughs> we're so deeply moved by what you have to say. I'm still thinking about how you said the, the murals are a vaccine uh, against uh, police brutality and. Uh, 
uh, sort of a first response and effect of healing. And uh, the many history, layers of history in a city, of course, you know, um, very exciting thing as well. And so we're now going to go out and uh, look at some of these murals that we can see and uh, maybe even imagine some of our own that could be there and expand this conversation with our own practice. And with that, I think we're ready to thank you for an uh, inspiring noon lecture. And uh, uh, and maybe we can uh, uh, reach out to you uh, oh, of course. If, if we want to help contribute somehow. Is there a, is there a, a, a Venmo or something for supporting this project? Uh, is there a way to reach Not you? at the time, um, but I would rather that if you wanted to learn more or just kind of talk, that you come by my office, 512 Social Science Building. Uh, my door is always open. It's the one with, actually, it's the office with the door open. Yeah, because they're talking about loneliness and despair. That's it. The door with, you know, the office with the door open. We can talk about it a little bit more and maybe see if you're very interested in or you have ideas of your own work that you might be doing. Yeah. And then anything that comes afterwards, um, you know, would be with uh, your your expertise or whatever you're yourself working on. So, yeah. Sounds great. So one, a more, quick, one, one more quick oh, question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I had also had a quick like connect connecting this lecture to last week's lecture and um, this idea of media euphoria and the ability to go back and look at an archive of these murals and for people to be able to re-experience a moment of um, empowerment, I think is really amazing. And I think maybe a next step is just getting this website to more viewers. Yeah, and uh, this is done on Adobe Spark, which doesn't can, I don't think it was intended to hold this kind of gallery, even though it looks really pretty on it. <laughs> so definitely something like that, that's uh, more public and it's able to be used for different purposes. Um, if you're an educator, to, to create a curriculum. If you're an artist, to, to, uh, to build that relationship and conversation. Um, all, you know, if you're an activist, how you can use that tool. It is open for that, um, like, yeah. Oh, one more, go ahead. Thinking, um... In terms of archiving and being it being more accessible, um, do you have a, like an Instagram page? Because I'm thinking about the page um, Veterana Sirukas, um, something like that, where people can upload all the murals, and it could be like a collective um, archive on social media. That'd be a great idea. Um, I, yeah, that'd be my, uh, Instagram would be definitely a place. Uh, we try to put all the Instagram handles of all the artists that we at least could identify on here. So, and we, we, yeah, they're linked on here too as well so that you could always go into theirs. Um, but to also have like a page dedicated, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, there's so much I think. And you know, I, I, we right now as part of the change, Ethnic Sites Changemaker Project, we're able to still continue to work on this. And, and because we have tons of other interviews that we haven't done podcasts about. So we're gonna pull out some more podcasts um, especially around the work of C.C. Carpio and Trust Your Struggle, who have been doing amazing work. Um, and so I, I think it'll continue to expand. And, but also, um, it'll take a life of its own in terms of its message, right? So we're thinking that those messages, as we're talking about, um, can, can continue to uh, form as, as, as we continue to struggle uh, against uh, state violence, police violence, and so forth, and alongside with communities most impacted. So, I mean, that's always the intention. Um, so definitely, I, I think that's a great idea. Any last? Well, no, definitely thank you all. Um, I love this, I love this place. I mean, look at this thing. Can you imagine all our classes being in a place like this? <laughs> um, but thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, bravo.